Good afternoon, everyone. It's 2 o'clock in the east, 11 o'clock out west, and the Liberty Power is back. Welcome to a brand new edition of Freedom Watch, streaming live from the highly acclaimed Strategy Room on FoxNews.com. I'm Judge Andrew Napolitano. We will discuss the issues that profoundly affect your freedom, your civil liberties, your financial liberties, and your right to have a government that stays within the confines of the natural law and of the Constitution that was written to govern it. We encourage you to take part in, our, in today's hour. We encourage you to send your tweets to Shelley Roche. We'll answer your questions throughout the show, and Shelley will join us with more of your comments toward the end of the program. Congressman Ron Paul, Mr. Daniel Hannon, Lou Rockwell, Tom Woods, Peter Schiff, Tom Palmer from Cato are all here, and that's our lineup. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Congressman Ron Paul, member of Congress from the great state of Texas, and Daniel Hannon, a member of the European Union, together right here for the first time on Freedom Watch. Congressman Paul, Mr. Hannon, welcome here. Thanks very much Thank for having you. me on, Judge. Okay. It's a huge uh, honor to be on with the conference. Congressman Paul, uh, to you first. Since last we spoke, which was about uh, two weeks ago, there have been a number of interesting uh, developments. There's a new timeline in the torture debate. We now know that President Bush uh, ordered the CIA to do certain things after he had signed a law prohibiting it and after the Supreme Court had said that the uh, Geneva Conventions apply. Uh, we've had the governor of your home state say that the laws are becoming so oppressive that it's time to secede from the union. And that caused uh, quite a kerfuffle and sent people like you and me uh, to the history books. And we've had the secretary of the Treasury say yesterday that he thinks that he has the power somehow under the Constitution and the laws to regulate the salaries of executives at banks that did not take TARP or other funds. Let's start with the last of these three. First, where would the Treasury get the chutzpah to say to a bank that took no aid from the federal government, you're paying your executives too much, we want you to trim their salaries? Well, they get it because of the lax attitude of the people and the Congress. They have no authority, they know that. But if you look at history, traditionally, anybody who's given any power in government, they always tend to abuse it. This is almost inevitable. But the uh, restrictions should be placed uh, on the people. That's what the Constitution is supposed to do. So because uh, some individuals in government tend to act like uh, many have predicted they would act, it uh, doesn't mean that it's all their fault. It's our fault, too, for not restraining them. Why don't we do more in the Congress? Why aren't we yelling and screaming and restricting uh, what uh, these officials are doing? Why aren't the courts in support of restraining these individuals? But any time these e issues get, you take the monetary issue. When it gets into a court, it always rules in favor of the state. So the courts are derelict in their duties. The Congress is derelict in their duties to restrain individuals like Geithner and the Fed chair chairman and our presidents and the people are derelict because we still have a system that if we really got riled up, we'd throw a lot of these people out and insist that we restrain the government. And would, would you be surprised uh, if Gordon Brown uh, and his chancellor of the Exchequer, a job that uh, the prime minister himself held for a number of years, years he would just as soon forget, I'm sure, uh, tried to regulate the salaries of bankers at banks that did not receive direct aid from the British government or from the Bank of England? Almost nothing would surprise me about these guys anymore. <clears throat> Let me first of all say it's a, it's a real honor for me to be on the, on the same show as, as Congressman Paul. He's a real patriot. He's a great American. And he is a champion of freedom lovers on every continent. Um, and I, I agree very much with the point that he just made. I mean, one of the things that I admire about the congressman is his belief in the Constitution. And I think the people who drafted your Constitution knew what they were doing when they put Congress in Article 1 and the presidency in Article 2. And congressmen cannot get off the hook and say that this is all the problem of executive officials. I think you have to take uh, responsibility as elected representatives. Would it happen in Britain? Well, we did it in Britain. We did it in Britain in the 70s. We had a, uh, an appalling set of policies called collectively the prices and incomes policies where the state tried to do exactly that. It tried to regulate the, the, the price of things in the shop and the amount that you were paid. And 
it led to stagnation and debt and eventually national bankruptcy. It would have seemed inconceivable a couple of years ago that we could ever go back to that, but this Labour government is revisiting the 70s in lots of other ways. You know, we've gone back to the uh, the printing of money, we've gone back to the huge deficit, we've gone back to the, the socialism and the class war, so yeah, I could totally see them doing something like this. Uh, Congressman Paul, uh, since we met last, the state of Minnesota, the, the, the state of Montana enacted legislation saying that if a handgun is manufactured in Montana, says that it's manufactured in Montana, and never leaves the state, and if the same is the case with ammunition, that as far as the state of Montana is concerned, that gun and its operator are free from any federal regulation. This is, of course, a modern version of nullification, some of which we have a little bit already. As you know, Indiana and Arizona re reject the federal time zones. There are states that reject the federal ban on uh, marijuana and use it for medicinal purposes, and the government, the federal government has stopped prosecuting people in those states. What do you think of this effort by Montana to take a stand for nullification and for states' rights? Is there, in your view, a chance that this is a flame that could spread throughout the country, or is it hopeless once it makes its way into the hands of the collectivists in Washington? No, I, I think this is very encouraging. I think it's not the single flame, but it's part of the flame that is starting to burn throughout the country in, in the many, many states. But in a way, it's sort of sad that we have to go at it this way because this should have been an automatic. So we're trying to nullify what the courts have done. If we had correctly interpreted the Interstate Commerce Clause, like originally, it was to make sure you could trade in and out. You should have never used the Interstate Commerce Clause to restrict people's use of certain products. We were supposed to have a free market economy. People and goods and services could go back and forth. But since they used the Interstate Commerce Clause to restrict even what was, you know, interstate, uh, they, they are now making this point, which is absolutely correct. It's very beneficial, but we also must emphasize that uh, the original intent was, would have never permitted uh, us to get into this situation. So I think this is encouraging. I think more is coming because as time goes on, our federal government is going to be so inept in delivering their promises. So even if they don't come to us because of the morality of our position, they will come to us because they will say, well, the money doesn't work. The checks are bouncing. The government can't do it. They can't run our foreign policy. Therefore, we have to have a new system. I think there's going to be a de facto se secession almost. You know, what if the money doesn't work? Why send any money in? You know, uh, the tax revenues may just dwindle. So in a way, I think it's very healthy. The danger is, of course, if the system breaks down, which it very well could, is that uh, too many will resort to what we need is a firm hand and we'll move further toward dictatorship and move along toward uh, a, a tyrant running a socialist economy. And that's why it's scary when you hear Geithner and others talking about setting salaries and owning businesses. So we we live in precarious times, but I'm still hopeful that we can alert enough people in this country and essentially around the world uh, to rise up and say, freedom works. We don't need the government to take care of us any longer. Mr. Hannon, as you know, Ron Paul is not only a patriot, he's, he's a hero and he's fearless because he's not afraid to touch the third rail in American politics, which is the notion of secession, something that I know you have a personal interest, uh, uh, interest in. Of course, we fought a civil war over the issue of secession, but since that civil war, there's a Supreme Court opinion saying, yes, a state could secede if enough of the other states agreed with it. Uh, Congressman Paul also raises, and this I'd like to hear you on, the issue of the regulation of interstate commerce. When Madison wrote our Constitution, he gave the Congress the power to regulate interstate commerce. At the time, to regulate meant to keep regular to make sure that there is interstate commerce, not to decide the who, what, when, where, how, and how much we can tax of interstate commerce and what we can prohibit in it. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I'm not a U.S. citizen. I think it would be presumptuous of me to get into detailed debates about nullification or secession or the Madison versus Jefferson arguments. Let me just say this. The U.S. has the enormous strength that its constitution and 